And good morning, everyone. So good to see all of you. It's always so nice to enter these doors and see all those friendly faces and big smiles. Very encouraging. There's a scripture I'd like for us to think about today that says we are to encourage one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Let's read that scripture. Please turn to Hebrews chapter 10 and we'll read verses 24 and 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So we are to stir up one another. We are to, to uh, help one another in good works and in love. And it goes on to say in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. But exhorting one another, here is that verse, exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now the word exhorting here, we're going to focus on the last part of verse 25 this morning in the sermon. The word exhorting is from the Greek word parakletos, and it has three basic meanings, and the context usually determines which it is, but all three meanings are very closely related. The meanings are, number one, encourage, number two, comfort, and number three, exhort. And the King James Version here and the New King James Version translate this word exhorting, but the NIV and the uh, New Revised Standard Version and others translate it as encourage or encouraging. So let's say that all three meanings may be, may apply in Hebrews 10 and verse 25, that we are to encourage one another, we are to comfort one another, and we are to exhort one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. And so that's what I'd like for the title of, of the message to be, encouraging one another so much the more. How can we encourage and comfort and exhort one another? And so much more as we see the day approaching, which we certainly do. First of all, maybe it would be good to make a comment or two about the day. The definite article is in the Greek. The Greek manuscripts have the definite article, the day. Commentaries, a few of them say that it's been suggested this could be about the coming fall of Jerusalem, but these same commentaries say that more than likely this is really referring to a day of judgment uh, at, the, uh, at the time of the end. And of course, uh, for them, the day of judgment might be people going, uh, receiving a sentence to, to go down to hell or be taken up to heaven. But um, for us, we, we know that the, uh, the day would refer this day of judgment to the second coming of Jesus Christ and setting up of God's kingdom and it will be a day of judgment for a thousand years and and then for the second resurrection period of time as well so the day will certainly refer to the time that is just ahead of us then when Jesus Christ will return and begin that time of judgment during the Millennium and the second resurrection let's ask ourselves this question before we uh, proceed any further do we see the day approaching? Well, if we are alert to world news and all that is happening, we certainly see that we, yes, are living at that time. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4 says that knowledge will be increased at the time of the end, and many will be running to and fro. Certainly today, we see that all around us. Knowledge has been increased and is increasing and people are running to and fro as never before. Second Timothy 3 and verses 1 to 4 brings out that at the time of the end, it, there will be perilous times, all kinds of evils taking place, corrupt social conditions, Bru people brutal. We see a lot of brutality in the news today. We certainly do live in dangerous and perilous times. So we see the day certainly approaching from the standpoint of social conditions. And then Jeremiah 30 verses 6 and 7 brings out that a time of Jacob's trouble 
Of course, we have to understand who Jacob is that is referring to the 12 tribes of Israel and in particular to the tribes of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh. And we certainly see that, that America no longer has that moral uh, advantage that we had at one time and that modern day Israel has become very corrupt, very divided, all kinds of evils. We are definitely on the decline. A time of trouble lies ahead. And then as far as the day Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 was answering the question about the time of the end and the sign of his coming and uh, he gave various things that would happen that we see happening leading up to a time of great tribulation. And we know the world has the nuclear weapons now to bring on destruction of human life. Jesus said no flesh would be left alive except those days were cut short. You know, a, nu a, a full exchange of nuclear weapons, of just weapons that exist now in Russia and in our country and in China, other countries that have nuclear weapons would create what scientists have called a nuclear winter, that a full exchange of nuclear weapons would create a world that is, is a gloomy, dark. Crops would not be able to produce any uh, food. Human life and animal life would not be possible then. Uh, all flesh would be destroyed. And Jesus talked about that in Matthew chapter 24. So let me ask the question again. Do we see the day approaching? We certainly do, most definitely. So let's get back to uh, the last part of verse 25 again, exhorting or encouraging or comforting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I believe that there are, there are things here that we need to expound on and maybe expand on uh, that will help us to fulfill this admonition that we should be encouraging and exhorting and comforting one another. So let's think about some ways that we can comfort, exhort, one, and encourage one another. We can begin even right here in these verses where it says in verse 24 to consider one another to stir up to love and good works. What are some ways that we could stir up to love and to good works? You know, one, one way is, as we go on in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. I tell you, th this assembly is very, very important to encourage one another. As I mentioned, when I enter these doors, um, those big smiles and friendly faces and warm handshakes, there's some, something awfully encouraging about that, about you. And this is the highlight of the week. We go our own way. We're like spiritual pioneers. We're out there all alone in a hostile world. And uh, then we come together and here are people that of like mind and led by God's spirit. People that, that, that uh, we have everything in common with and that we're here to encourage one another. We're here to actually stir up to love and to good works. And we, we can do that by the fellowship and the uh, well, attending every week if we can. I know that some drive long distances and gasoline is uh, going up in cost, but uh, let's, let's strive to attend every time if possible, if we don't have sickness or some other reason. And when we're here to meet and to greet all the members, circulate around, just don't talk to the same ones every week, but but, but, and including the children, get, and get to know the children by name as well. We have a, about a third of our congregation, roughly, would be young people below the age of 20. And so uh, it's important that we spend time with them as well. Let's uh, go to Second John, verse 12. This, how important is it, this fellowship that we have with each other each week at church services? This is a very important part of the service. Certainly the sermon, sermonette, singing songs, the service itself is number one priority, but right up there with that is the fellowship that we have with one another. Let's read in 2 John and verse 12. Having many things to write to you, I do not wish to do so with paper and ink, 
but I hope to come to you. He was hoping to come to be with them, to see them, and speak face to face that our joy may be full. You know, you can't do that when uh, you are not here. You have to come here in order to speak to someone face to face. And we're not able to during the week. We're too scattered. We have people that live uh, an hour or more away. We live in different, we're scattered in different directions. We can't speak face to face during the week. Even if we stay in touch by phone and email, which we, of course, should do. Um, certainly uh, very good to stay in contact that way. But there's nothing like face to face. Just uh, they're a, a few feet apart and talking and fellowshipping face to face. Third John, the next little, little book here, verse 13, has a similar idea um, or thought. Verse 13, I had many things to write, but I did not wish to write to you with pen and ink. He didn't want to just do it by telephone call or email or, or writing, which is all they could do back at that time. Verse 14, but I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Again, face to face, there's just nothing like that kind of encouragement toward one another. Peace to you, our friends greet you, and let us greet the friends by name. It is good to be able to know everyone's name, and I still kind of struggle sometimes with some of the names of our, of our children, uh, but uh, even though we don't you know, we're not a real large congregation, but still, I'd like to be able to call each one by name. Very important. So, being able to, to come here at church services and have the messages that are given to us, those messages are very encouraging. The messages stir us up to love and, and provoke us to love and good works. But then being able to fellowship before services, you know, we can come at least 15 or 20, 30 minutes ahead of time. And then after services, to stay around. Many people stay around an hour or, or more after services. We're very scattered, and we take advantage then of that opportunity that we have. Let's turn to one other scripture on this in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 16. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 16. Malachi 3 and verse 16. Those, then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. And so a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Those that feared God spoke to one another. You know, the King James translation has, has then they that feared the Lord spake often to uh, one to another adds the word often I'm not sure if that is in the original language the Hebrew text or not I didn't check it that out that far uh, I didn't find that in other some other translations but uh, the new King James does not include often but I think we can say that as often as possible we should be speaking to one another and that it, it is so much uh, better if we're able to speak to one another face to face so face-to-face -face fellowship is a good way to encourage one another. And after services, we, can, we have things we can talk about. We can talk about the sermon itself, the sermonette. We can talk about world news and conditions, things that are happening. We can talk about personal things, uh, too, that we're doing and help, uh, helps us to get to feel closer to one another and what we're going through uh, in our lives during the week. There are many things we can talk about. We just don't want to be doing any business deals. We don't want that, but uh, uh, we certainly can, can talk about personal things that will be of interest so that people get to know us better and we get to know them and feel closer to them and them to us. You know, we all have spiritual gifts that, will, that can help us to encourage and to comfort. Let's read about those gifts beginning in Romans chapter 12 and verse 4. Romans chapter 12 and verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. Each member has a different function in the church. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually 
members of one another. We're all part of that one body that Christ is the head of. Having then, verse 6 now, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. We're to use those gifts that we are given. And everybody has gifts, a gift or gifts given to him. If it's prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. That would include uh, speaking. If a person is gifted in, in being able to speak, then use it uh, because that's a gift, a God-given gift to use. Or ministry, serving. Some people are so good at doing that. Uh, we all can serve, though. Uh, we can all minister, uh, but some have a special gift of ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts, and that's the word then again for encourage and comfort in exhortation. He who gives, those who have been blessed with, uh, let's say, the ability to give, with liberality. He who leads with diligence. Who, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And so whatever our gift might be, we can use it to serve the uh, church in the church. We all do have gifts, God-given gifts that we can use that will encourage and comfort and exhort. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter also mentions about gifts given to us. And we can use the, our gifts that we are given to serve and to encourage one another and to exhort one another. The word exhort carries, carries with it a little meaning of uh, urging on. You know, sometimes maybe uh, encouraging is good and comforting is good. Sometimes there needs to be a little bit of urging on, perhaps uh, in just the right way as well. Urging on or exhorting. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 9, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Of course, that's the way that we can uh, be encouraging too with our hospitality. As each one has received a gift, each of us has a gift, then minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. He who speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom be glory and dominion forever and ever. So it all is to the glory of, of God, not to our glory, but to, we are to use our spiritual gifts to minister and to serve and to encourage and comfort and exhort. You know, we can, other ways, thoughts that, we, that I have, I'd like to present on being able to comfort and to encourage, there are... We, we can look around our congregation and beyond, and are there, are there ones that have special needs? Special needs like sicknesses or, or things. You know, I can think of ones even right now, can't you, in our congregation that, are, uh, that, are, that we can pray for. We've got a couple recovering from COVID-19. We know about that, and they are thankfully recovering, but to be praying for them every day and uh, maybe send an encouraging card or note um, or a phone call. Well, I'm not sure if they're up to phone calls yet or not. We know we had a lady that took a fall and uh, she is improving. But uh, to pray for her and ones with special needs. Let's turn to James chapter 1 and verse 27. We can be encouraging to ones who have a special need. In James chapter 1, we read about that in verse 27. James 1 and verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. So this is what, how James defines pure and undefiled religion before God. And that is to visit orphans and widows in their trouble. And to keep yourself unspotted from the world. But to visit orphans and widows in their trouble. Maybe sometimes they might be too far away, but a card or a phone call, an email, 
can, can uh, certainly be very encouraging to a person that is going through a sickness or some type of trouble. When someone loses a loved one's, a loved one, that is an ideal time to comfort and to encourage, to show concern. Let's uh, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul mentions here that we can encourage one that has suffered loss, maybe loss of a close loved one or maybe someone um, that has just had a recent death in the family. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. And then he brings out about the resurrection. You know, that is always encouraging to say, you know, this is not the end of the story. This is just a break in the action. And you're going to see your loved one again. And it's going to be a much better time. So it's, it's a time to give encouragement. And he ends this, <clears throat> ends this section by saying in verse 18, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. We can comfort by bringing out the truth. You know, that's even true if uh, we have a death where someone is uh, not in the church and has suffered a loss. Uh, it, it, there are times to, to bring out the truth to them, to be encouraging to them and say, well, you know, According to the scriptures, um, all that have died will come back to life again. The next thing they know, and in a resurrection, and is, it can be encouraging to ones not in the church to sometimes comfort them that way as well. You know, another way that we can think about comforting is uh, let's go to Second Corinthians chapter two and verse six. Second. Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6. What if we had someone to leave the church and then to come back to the church a bit later? That would be a time to welcome that person back with open arms. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and uh, verse 6. This is talking about the one that in 1 Corinthians had to be put out of the church for a while because of sexual immorality. Verse 6, this punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man. This person now is coming back to the service, uh, to the church, repentant. So verse 7, so that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him. You know, someone did leave, and you know the congregation would have been aware of the sexual immorality that caused this person to, be, to have to not come for a while. Uh, but they would, they would forgive all of that and, and welcome this person back. What a wonderful thing that he is now back. He's repented. The sin has been washed away. And so uh, rather forgive and comfort him. You know, it might not be just easy coming back for him. Comfort him and let him know how wonderful it is, it is to see him back once again. Lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. So we would want to make sure we make welcome. And what if someone has, uh, let's say, just left the church? We, we still have people from years ago that left, even and after many years, are now coming, now come back. Well, that's a, a chance to really just welcome them, shake their hand, give them a big hug, let them know how wonderful it is to see them again. It's a time to really encourage that person. How wonderful, how welcome he will feel when we do that. If we see someone that is just down and out, someone seems discouraged, it's an opportunity to comfort and encourage if any member suffers sickness or disease or a heavy trial or tragedy strikes in some way, we do have a chance to comfort and encourage. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11. 
And this is in line with the uh, scripture in Hebrews about giving encouragement all the more as, you, as we see the day approaching. First, First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11. And this is, if you read the uh, first 10 verses of this chapter, you will see that it's talking about the time of the end. Verse 1, concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. That day, the day, comes unexpectedly. And when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes. So it's talking about the time of the end. He says that we're not to sleep, but to be, watch and be sober. Verse 6. And again in verse 8, to be sober. But notice in verse 11, after all this about the, that day uh, when Christ will return, the time of the end, at the time of the end of this age, verse 11 says, Therefore, comfort. And my margin in the New King, King James Version has encourage. Therefore, comfort. It, it is the word paracletus. Comfort each other. Encourage each other and edify. And the margin says, build up, build up one another, just as you also are doing. So, yes, as uh, these events that happen in, on the world scene, we can encourage. And so much the more as we see the day approaching. You know, I was thinking uh, about this sermon. This is a little bit beyond what Hebrews 10.25 is saying. Hebrews 10.25 is really talking to the church. Exhort one another. Comfort one another. Encourage one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. It's talking about the church. But can, you, can we have opportunities that come along situations where we would encourage people not in the church? I think, I think so. Um, just an example of that. Let's turn over to Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. There may be occasions where we can say something that will be encouraging to people outside the church, as the Apostle Paul did here. The Apostle set an excellent example here in this chapter. He's on, on this voyage to Rome, Acts chapter 27. And he warned the people about continuing their journey, um, but they continued in spite of his uh, admonition not to. And they shipwrecked. They shipwrecked. And verse 20 goes on to say that uh, it was so bad a storm that when neither sun or stars appeared for many days, uh, they, they gave up all hope. All hope that we would be saved was finally given up. They said, we're not going to make it. After long abstinence from food, Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart. He's encouraging them. He's comforting them. I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God, to, whom I, uh, to the God to whom I belong. Interesting there. There stood an angel of the God to whom I belong. I mean, my God, the God I serve, uh, his angel stood by me, and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. They're going to make it. Verse 25, Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. So Paul was very encouraging to these people in this uh, storm. Verse 33 goes on to say, As the day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food. And he said, Today is the fourteenth day. You have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Therefore I urge you. That's, um, that's amazing. Fourteen days without food. Therefore I urge you to take nourishment. For this is for your survival. Since not a hair of your hair shall fall from your head, the head of any of you. When he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. So here's Paul setting the, an example uh, before everybody. When he had broken, he began to eat. Verse 36, then they were all encouraged 
and also took food themselves. And in all, we were 276 people. That's a pretty big ship, wasn't it? 276 people on it. So, you know, um, not only might we, you know, should we exhort and comfort and uh, encourage one another here in the church, which is what Hebrews 10, 25 is talking about, but there may be opportunities to do like the Apostle Paul. What if people on the job are talking about some of these things that are happening in our country and in the world? You might have an opportunity to say, well, you know, according to the scriptures, which talk about this time that we're living in, uh, we're going to have this to happen, but up to a certain point before the God of heaven will step in to cut it short. You might be able just to say a few things that we didn't, uh, and to say, let's be encouraged to know that this is not going to go on to destroy human life or anything of that type. The God of heaven is going to cut it all short. You might be able to say something that would encourage co-workers or neighbors and like the apostle Paul to encourage the people that are not even in the church. You know, this is a sermon about being able to encourage one another, to comfort one another, and exhort one another. I want us to uh, have to take a, a little uh, different slant, and that is to ask who is the greatest encourager of all. It is our great God. He encourages us constantly in ways that we don't even often think about. Let's read a few verses about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. God is constantly encouraging us in all the troubles that we go through. The Apostle Paul writes about it, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and uh, beginning in verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. He's saying that since he's received so much comfort and encouragement from God, then he's able to pass that on to them. And he goes on to describe and talk more about how uh, God comforts us so that we learn to comfort and encourage others. We learn to empathize with others. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 6. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 6. Nevertheless, again he's talking about in the pre previous verse, letter part of the previous verse, he said, out, we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. Verse 7, nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. So God is constantly comforting. He's a comforting God. Think of ways that God and Christ encourage and comfort us real quickly. Romans chapter 15, God comforts us by the scriptures. These scriptures here, to read them, anywhere we turn, we are going to be encouraged when we read them. And God comforts us then by the scriptures. In Romans chapter 15 and verse 5, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus. What? The God of patience and comfort. And verse 4, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. These scriptures are awfully encouraging, awfully comforting. Anytime we're downcast, we can read them and be encouraged. So God encourages us by the scriptures. Another way that he encourages us is by the Holy Spirit. Let's turn to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. Now, the word helper goes back to the word parakletos or parakletos. It means comforter, an encourager. He will give you another comforter then or encourager. 
that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. In verse 26, but the helper, even my, even my margin has comforter or parakletos, the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance. So God encourages us by the scriptures. He encourages us by his spirit. And there's a third way that God encourages us. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 2. And while we're turning there, he encourages us by giving us a merciful high priest who understands everything that we are going through. Everything that we will face in this life. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17. Therefore in all things he, and that's Christ, talking about Christ, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. So we have a high priest who understands what we're going through. Understands fully. Chapter 4 and verse 15. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So God our Father is the greatest encourager of all. And he encourages us through the scriptures. He encourages, he encourages us by the Holy Spirit that he gives to us and by our merciful high priest. He is the greatest encourager and comforter of all. But he wants his sons, he wants us to be good encouragers as well. And we can grow in that ability to give comfort and encouragement, lift up the spirit and the morale of someone, someone that may be sick or bereaved or depressed or down. Everyone can be a good encourager. We can use that power of encouragement. Just the right words. We can have the right words that encourage. Proverbs 12, 25, we won't turn there, but says good words make glad the heart. And Proverbs 25 and verse 11 says, Words fitly spoken are like apples of gold. But I think it goes on in pictures of silver. Proverbs 18 and verse 21 says that there's life and death in the power of the tongue. So there's death you can discourage uh, with the tongue. Um, or you can choose to encourage and give life. We want to choose that one. You know, a few, few comments about encouragement, the power of encouragement. Often, encouragement might be just being there. Sometimes it's simply just listening. Maybe it's a warm smile, a hearty, friendly handshake. Sometimes it is cheering up, exhorting just a little bit, urging on. We can do it. We can make it with God's help. But you and I have opportunities for the encouragement every day. We can encourage at home. Husbands and wives can encourage each other so much the more as the day approaches. My wife and I talk about these things. We encourage each other. I'm very thankful about that. Parents and children. And don't children... You know, parents can encourage the children. And children need encouragement. They need to be able to understand this age that we are living in. And, uh, in, and, and to receive encouragement that a better age is coming. And that, that, that they can survive this evil age that they're coming up in. You know, you know, children coming up today is much different than when I came up as a, as a youth. So children need special encouragement and instruction on doing that. But I think children, you can encourage your parents as well. Certainly obey them. You can uh, let them know how much you appreciate all they do for you. There are many ways that children can encourage their parents. So, but members of the church and uh, 
brethren, such as like visiting the widows or sending cards. So many ways that we can use encouragement toward one another. We can become true encouragers and comforters. Think about this. When Christ returns, we're going to, be, we're going to need to be able to comfort this world will be almost at the brink of, of destroying itself. Uh, and uh, we will have people that need a lot of encouragement and comfort. Let's read a couple of verses on that. Isaiah 40. So we, we this ability to encourage is going to come in very handy at that time. We need to be able to instruct and encourage people and give them hope. Ones who have lost all hope, to give them hope. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 1. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem. And cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she has received from the Lord's hand double for her sins. So we need to be able to encourage and lead people and show them and give them hope. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61. And verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and console those who mourn in Zion and give them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning so we're, we're going to be there helping Jesus Christ comfort the world at his second coming in many ways, the millennium is going to begin, maybe even more this way, but all during the millennium, it will, we will be doing a work of encouraging, comforting, exhorting, encouraging people toward the kingdom of God, encouraging them toward the fulfillment of the reason for their existence. And think about the second resurrection. Well, I can... I can see a lot of need for giving encouragement and comfort at that time or people that died horrible deaths screaming uh, in pain and agony as they were being maybe stabbed to death uh, they're going to need a lot of comfort a lot of encouragement and, and exhorting them uh, on God's truth and God's way of life so in the second resurrection we're going to be doing a lot of encouraging and comforting. Well, my time is running out, but I do have a couple of scriptures I'd like to turn to to conclude. Let's go to Acts chapter 4 and verse 36. We have here a gentleman, one of our brethren in times of old, who set a good example for what, what we're talking about today, the ability to encourage others. Acts chapter 4 and verse 36. Here were people in the early church. Verse 32, they had one heart and one soul. Uh, people sold possessions and brought the money and gave it to the apostles. Verse 35, laid, it, laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as everyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas, we know him as Barnabas more than Joseph's. Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement. He was a Levite of the country of Cyprus, and he had land. He sold it and brought the money and gave it to laid it at the apostles' feet. But you know what a wonderful example Barnabas set of encouragement. Son of encouragement. I wouldn't mind having a name like that, would you? able to comfort, able to encourage, son of encouragement. Let's follow the example of Barnabas. 
Okay, and let's turn for a final scripture back to Hebrews. We begin in Hebrews 10.25, and that is to uh, encourage, encouraging one another, and so much the more as the day approaches. Let's end with Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13. You know, the Hebrews did have a need for encouragement. If you read the book of Hebrews, if you are familiar with it, there were people that were losing sight. There were people that were letting down. And they needed encouragement. And so the writer of this book is encouraging them in all of the book to really get back the zeal, get back the, the closeness to God. They had just, they'd lost, many of them had lost it. Some were not attending services as we read anymore. So in Hebrews 10, 25, uh, he was admonishing them uh, to exhort and encourage one another and so much the more as the day approaches. But now let's read Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13, a similar verse, but exhort. Well, verse 12, notice uh, the warning that is there. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. We certainly don't want that to happen to us. But verse 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. Don't put it off until tomorrow. And the New King James has a marginal reference. Encourage, exhort, encourage. It's that word paracletus, and it means to encourage. It means to comfort. It means to exhort. So exhort one another, encourage one another daily while it's called today. Don't put it off. So let's remember. Let's remember Hebrews 10 verse 25 and Hebrews 3 and verse 13. As world events worsen in the days ahead, and we know that they will, we are to encourage one another. We are to comfort one another, and we are to exhort one another. And so much the more as the day approaches.